Hartford was a stepchild from the very beginning. It was a stepchild franchise coming out of a stepchild league. In the 80s, they, they had some really good teams teams led by Ron Francis and then it came to a point where Ron Francis got traded. From there it, it, the franchise seemed to start to drop off. You know Boston was, was an hour and a half down the turnpike you know and then you had the Rangers you had the Islanders and as Pete Carmanos told us he, it was like playing in the Bermuda Triangle. Well to be good it wasn't too hard a decision. <laughs> If they offered the job, I was, I was going. We would have guys, their anchors, get off and then drive up and catch the third period. You know, they'd come through the press gate mm -hmm. and catch the third period to, to see the games. Chris Berman was a huge Hartford Whalers fan. You know, just that last game, seeing the fans, and Kevin addressed the crowd, you know, after the game, and it was a pretty sad moment. So that's how it ended, and we, we ended up going to Raleigh. Welcome to the Canes Corner Podcast with your host, Adam Gold. The Canes Corner Podcast is a part of the Capital Broadcasting Podcast Network. And now, here's Adam. Hi, this is Adam Gold, and welcome to the 25th anniversary Canes Corner Podcast Special. A look back at the franchise during its period of relocation and uncertainty as it moved south, eventually to Raleigh, North Carolina. In episode one, we covered the more general topic of learning of the move itself. Today, over the next half hour, we'll hone in on what the now Hurricanes left behind. The Hartford Whalers were actually first known as the New England Whalers, beginning play in the fall of 1972 in the old World Hockey Association. In fact, they were the first WHA champion, defeating the Winnipeg Jets four games to one in the Avco Cup Final. They would have the best record in the league in each of the first three seasons and made the playoffs all seven times before the WHA went away, and as it was, the top four clubs were all accepted into the National Hockey League. The Whalers were in Hartford for 17 seasons, albeit a period of time in Springfield, Massachusetts, making the playoffs eight times, including seven straight from 1986 through 1992. But in spite of some pretty good teams, they won just one playoff series and faced a myriad of challenges that served as major obstacles to success. Everything from economics to competition to geography worked against the team, made it seem as though the Whalers were actually swimming upstream. So let's start our journey with then-television play-by-play voice John Forslund. Hartford was a stepchild from the very beginning. It was a stepchild franchise coming out of a stepchild league, it was the World Hockey Association, which uh, bludgeoned uh, the American Hockey League and took a lot of marginal players, gave them real quality money, um, and also challenged the Boston Bruins' territorial rights and the New York Rangers' territorial rights. And both of those teams were set up, the Bruins and the Rangers were set up for success in terms of television and marketing, and Hartford had no chance. It's a, if you look at the map, it's a very small region that we're talking about here. And uh, from a TV perspective, you could never penetrate even western Massachusetts. The Bruins have the, the rights to western Massachusetts. I grew up in Springfield, Mass. I grew up about a 25-minute drive from Hartford, and they made sure that those Bruin fans in western Massachusetts remained Bruin fans in 1979 when the Whalers came into the NHL. So they fought that battle, number one, and then there's the geography of being wedged between New York and Boston. And if you were a national rep for any company and you had to buy signage in Madison Square Garden and the new Fleet Center and then the Hartford Civic Center, you know, what would you do? You couldn't have, if you couldn't have all three, you'd pick New York and Boston and be set. And that would be enough visibility for your, for your company. You didn't really need Hartford. Hartford needed support from the insurance company. They needed support from the local businesses. But, you know, need and want are two different things, right? And that's kind of the, the issues and the challenges that the Whalers fought 100% all the way through, even in the glory days of the late 80s where they had a really good team. They couldn't get out of the Adams division, but they had a really good team. But it was the Whalers. They played in a mall. They were kind of this thing that didn't get total acceptance, and that's because there was worry. 
I think, from the, the, the NHL group that allowed those four teams in. There was real worry that these teams would be successful. So what do you do? You set, it, set them up, not for failure, but for challenges, which leads to failure and led to failure in Winnipeg, which forced them to Arizona, led to failure in Quebec, led them to Denver, Hartford. You know, when the only one that remained was Edmonton, and that's because it's Edmonton, right? <laughs> and so you're not going very far out of Edmonton. Longtime Hartford TV sportscaster Rich Coppola walks us through the Whalers' challenges at home. You know, it didn't have a long winning history, certainly leading up to that. So, you know, ticket sales, some years were pretty good. Other years weren't very good. But they had a poor deal with the then Hartford Civic Center, now the XL Center, uh, where they didn't get concessions and parking. So a lot of it was on was on ticket sales. And, you know, by the time the last few years hit, their TV deal uh, wasn't very good. I think it was a million dollars a year, while the Islanders at the same time had like an 18 or $19 million a year uh, deal. So uh, Emil Francis as a GM, when he signed you know, that deal in the uh, 80s, uh, Ron Francis was probably the highest paid whaler at three or 400000 I'm guessing. And then by the end of the deal, obviously, you have – multiple players making multiple million per year. So, you know, do the math. It was not a great fit. Then general manager Jim Rutherford. Well, there's two factors that lead towards the difference of attendance in the 80s and the 90s. In the 80s, they they had some really good teams, teams led by Ron Francis. And then, and then it came to a point where Ron Francis got traded unexpectedly as a very young guy. Um from there, it, it, the franchise seemed to start to drop off. The other factor is what I said before, is the corporate community was, was much smaller in the 90s. So two things, you know, in the 80s, the, the better performance of the team than the team in the 90s, and the corporate community became much smaller. Roughly two hours from New York and Boston, and just 20 minutes south of the Massachusetts border, the Whalers were smack dab in the middle of a major challenge. Then media relations director Chris Brown. You're right in the outreaches of the boat of both. So you've got the Boston sphere that would come down into southern Connecticut, you know, and then you had the New York Rangers coming up as well. Um, so you were always in the mix. You were the new team on the block. There were plenty of homegrown fans for the team, um, and plenty of fans that had an allegiance to one, but. As long as you weren't playing that team, they they would cheer for the Whalers. Right. So it was tough. I think one of the interesting things in Hartford is the television deal was never as good as, say, Boston had in terms of coverage over free TV. But, again, you know, we used to have s- some classic games when Boston came to town. Um, you know, they'd have busloads of fans come down and empty out into the streets of Hartford, and, and you swear they've been drinking – Ever since they, they left, they left whatever terminal they left. So they always made for interesting games, but again, and and some great some great rivalry games. But I think Hartford was really growing a fan base that could have sustained the team long term. I think one of the issues again was um, the arena deal just wasn't right. there. Um, it was an older arena; it needed to be upgraded. It needed some public dollar investments which you know no one wanted to talk about back then now it's done all the time right just came to an impasse unfortunately and and i i think the fan base would have been able to um sustain the team it just was that arena deal and the corporate support which was probably the more challenging in in hartford glenn wesley came to the whalers from the bruins and actually liked the old civic center you know everybody can make fun of the mall and and all that they talked about of playing in Hartford, but when we had a full building, it was uh, it was a very intimidating building. You know, the hard part for us, Adam, was that you know Boston was was an hour and a half down the turnpike. You know, and then you had the Rangers, you had the Islanders, and as Pete Carmanos told us, he, it was like playing in the Bermuda Triangle. You know, for us being in Hartford, because we, you know, we weren't that uh, original six city and, and team with a lot of success with history and tradition of, you know, doing anything great in the playoffs, even though I was 
I was only into my third year at the time there. So that's, that's what, that's what made it difficult is, you know, people make fun of the, the green team as, as they used to call it. But, uh, you know, you see the logo now, even to this day. And, and, uh, it's a very classy, uh, Jersey and, and, uh, you know, a lot of tradition and history with that emblem. That logo does leave a mark and we'll find out more about it in a future episode. Back to Rich Coppola, who felt the team could have cast a wider net. I'm an example of, of someone who was already a hockey fan of someone by the time the Whalers got there. So my allegiance never really, as a young kid, my allegiance didn't turn just because we had an NHL team. I grew up downstate in the New Haven area, and I think had they, if they were to do it again right now, they needed to reach out um, outside of Hartford County a lot better because it's a small state. But you're never, you were never going to get Fairfield County, which is closest to New York, because they're kind of New Yorkers anyway, and they have all the New York teams. But they really didn't, didn't make enough of an effort into New Haven County to make those hockey fans feel that it was their team as well. It, the, the amazing thing was when the Bruins were in Hartford or the Rangers were in Hartford, if you were in the building but couldn't see the rink, say you were in the corridor or whatever, and a goal was scored, there was such a reaction that you had to wait and see if you heard Brass Bonanza to know if it was Whalers or the Bruins or Rangers. Chuck Caton, the only radio voice in franchise history on those nights when Boston or New York was in town. In the early years, whenever you would play the Rangers or the Bruins at the Hartford Civic Center, uh, there would be a 50-50 crowd. You'd have Bruin fans and Ranger fans, as many as Whaler fans. But as time went on, and as the team had more success from the mid-'80s on, you saw fewer and fewer Bruin fans being able to get into the building because more and more Whaler fans were buying the tickets for those games. But the atmosphere was always electric because it was a more intimate arena. Uh, you've got to remember there were only 15,000 seats in the Hartford Civic Center, and until the mid-'80s, there were no skyboxes. We know Jeff O'Neill as a hurricane, but Jeff O'Neill started his career in Hartford. You were stuck in the middle of New York and Boston, and, you know, there was diehard uh, Whaler fans, but it just didn't seem like there was enough of them, I guess. And the arena needed some upgrade. I don't know. It was. I enjoyed playing there. It was my first NHL experience, but you could tell for the core diehard fans, however many there was, it was, it was a sad time because... You know, it's always disappointing, I'm sure, for a city, whether it be Seattle with their basketball team or whoever, when that team's leaving, it's always a disappointing thing, so it's sad for those fans. Rich Coppola again on a region beaming with pride. You know, you talk about the identity crisis. Well, you know, being between New York and Boston, um, there's a lot of that goes that goes on here. And I'll tell you, the Travelers Championship, the old Greater Hartford Open, uh, I think one of the reasons uh, it does extremely well, uh, you know, wins awards as the, the, the player's favorite uh, tournament outside of majors is because there's a, there's a great tradition and there's a lot of pride in the state that this is something that is truly ours. We don't have to go to New York. We don't have to go to Boston. To, and they have to come here to see this tournament. And for a lot of people, that was the feeling with the Whalers as well. They're not Boston's team. They're not New York's team. They're our team. And I knew we'd be losing that. And we lost, you know, part of part of our identity when the when the team left. And then there's the other things. The Whalers were great in the community. They used to do a thing called the Whalers Waltz uh, for UConn. Uh, I think it was UConn Medical Center. And it raised a lot of money. And what I tried to express to people on the air is, you know, it's not just the sport that you lose. Well, how do you now make up? for stuff like that like where's that money going to come from now and all the charity work they did so you know it's a lot of that and they were our only major league team so yeah i was um i was extremely disappointed a little bit uh, a little bit angry i knew my job would never be um you know, would never be the same the final game before the announcement that the whalers were moving came with nine games left in the regular season Mark Anderson, now the president of the Hartford Whalers Booster Club, was there. That was the last Whaler game I ever went to. I never went to another game when they were here because I couldn't put any more money in Carmanos' pocket. I, I couldn't, with a good conscience, do it because I just couldn't grease his pocket anymore. I'm like, okay, I'm done. 
The Whalers store in the Hartford Civic Center is symbolic of the team's departure. A few Whalers hats and mementos left over, and fans here want the team the out. Fans, we went through this whole thing like the last game and everything. I think he made the decision to move to Raleigh. One more year is not going to make a difference. It's just going to make it harder for the fans. But over at the offices of the Connecticut Development Authority, a small group of fans gathered for a final effort to keep the team, or whack team owner Peter Carmanos, on the way out the door. I, for one, am not, not satisfied with, um, with letting this man go with the deal of the century. So the resolution is accepted. But within uh, moments, the deal was done. Here. CDA members voted to allow the Whalers to leave a year early on their state contract for a $22,700,000 exit fee. When it's in your blood, it's just in your blood. Here's more from Mark Anderson. The, the love of the team is still there. It's still there 25 years later. You still like the Hurricanes? I do. Do you like them more with a new owner? Yes, of course. Uh, the original plan for me was when that team got broken up, the 97 team got broken up as time goes on, you know, personnel changes and everything else, then I would find a new team. But the year after that happened, the Hurricane signed Ron Francis, and Ron Francis was always my favorite player from the time I first started following the team in 1983. So I couldn't root against him. I just couldn't. It's, I, I couldn't in my, again, it's a conscience thing. I just couldn't in my conscience root against him. So I'm like, well, okay. I, so we'll see how long this lasts. Knowing that Ronnie at that point was still, oh, he was getting a little long in the tooth at that point from a playing standpoint. You know, he had been drafted in, in the fall of 80, in the summer of 81. He had played, th you know, 10 years here so he had already been in the league like 18 or 19 years when he went back to when he went back to North Carolina so I'm going well hmm, you know maybe he's got three years left or four years left and then after that I'll just find a new team well it never happened you know they went to the cup in 02 and lost to Detroit Francis scored the game one in overtime in game one you know it was just I never switched allegiances where it would have been very easy to do so I never switched allegiances but I, I hate the Bruins I hate the Rangers when every passion of my being i hate the rangers so i hate the canadians so it's like I, there wasn't a team around here the islanders stink or stunk back then they really stunk back then you know the, I, I couldn't get into the devils i and i love the sport so i i just stayed with carolina and i'm one of the few that did back to then tv voice john forsland you know jimmy got there and he had heard a lot of things about hartford and then jimmy bought a house and lived there and ran the team and he was like i like it here they made a concerted effort to try and do the best they could. So the, immediately the, the fans got the message, we got to fill the building, and they did. So I think we exceeded 98, right around 99% capacity at the time of the move. Um, ticket sales were not a problem. It was corporate support and really the lease. And so um, that whole last season, as a matter of fact, um, I bought property in Maine the summer before the last season because I went in to the front office and said, I'm thinking about doing this, but I'm really concerned about where we're going here. And I was told, I think we're going to make it here. So Natalie and I bought a, a home in Maine uh, that we kept until the early 2000s because we thought we were going to stay there. Now, I might have been a fool, but I believed that it was going to work. And I thought the government would work with the new owner a little bit better than he did. Um, and the governor really, you know, showed his true colors at the end, in my opinion. A lot of people have a different opinion, and they want to pit uh, Peter Carmanis as a villain. I don't think there's an actual villain in all of this. I think everybody played a role. Um, but, I, but I do believe that last season started with a lot of speculation and rumor. And then as we went along, it seemed like the reality was coming. But I did not know of any kind of mood, move with certainty until I went home after a game in March and turned on the local news, and that's how I found out. Teams are made up of people, not just those that play the games, but those that make everything else happen. We'll hit that, how the faithful are keeping their fandom alive, and examine the noisy neighbors at the Worldwide Leader, all after the break. Welcome back to the Canes 25th Anniversary Podcast. I am Adam Gold. Let's continue the story, shall we? Remember then General Manager Jim Rutherford? Well, he grew to really like Hartford, though he knew that there were very difficult decisions coming. Uh, 
uh, I had only been there three years, but you get to know people and you, you become friends. And then, of course, all the people that you employ. I remember that day uh, when Pete Kermanis came in and spoke to the employees and said this was what was going to happen. Everybody that was employed was welcome to make the move, but these are people that that are from Hartford, and most of them didn't want to move. The one guy that did move was Skip Cunningham, <laughs> our uh, equipment trainer, and we're very happy he did. When they finally did announce they were coming to uh, Raleigh, they uh, gave us a weekend uh, to think about if we wanted to come, and they'd fly us down there to the staff that they were going to be bringing and stuff like that. And uh, you had to make a decision, uh, and then they said they'd fly you down and uh, take a look at the area some weekend where you wanted to be or whatever like that if you, in fact, were wanted to go with the team and were invited to go with the team. So, obviously, you were invited to go. How hard a decision was it for you? Well, with three kids, it wasn't too hard a decision. <laughs> if they offered the job, I was, I was going. And the other part is going to the unknown. I mean, we're, we're leaving Hartford. We knew what we had there, and then we're going to Carolina. We didn't have enough time to do a whole lot of research as to what was going to happen. And uh, in a short period of time, going into the unknown of trying to figure out how to how to make this work, certainly for the first couple of years until we got into our, our home. I spent a fair amount of time in Baltimore, Maryland, during a time after the Colts had left and before the Ravens showed up. And you know what never died? The fans. The fans who loved the old Baltimore Colts, the Artie Donovan, John Mackey, Johnny Unitas, Baltimore Colts. Same with Hartford. Here's Chuck Caton. A couple of weeks ago, we had the uh, fifth annual uh, Whalers uh, weekend uh, put on by the Hartford Yard Goats, right. the double-A franchise of the Colorado Rockies. And every year they bring back players. And we had 17 guys come back from the various eras. And it's going to be more to come in the future because it's getting a lot of traction right now with the the players who are really popular with the the, the fans, the Ron Francis's, the Kevin Deneens, the Dave Tippett's, the Mike Leutes. And everybody in our two-hour autograph session that we have on that Saturday of the weekend is in their 40s. And they were the kids that were most sure. devastated by it when they were like 10, 12, 14 years old. There was a doctor at St. Francis Hospital uh, Dr. Dan, I called him. He was a heart surgeon, and he couldn't have been more than 50 or 51 years old now, and he told me that he was in college when uh, the team moved. He was in medical school, right. and he followed me around the whole time because he said he used to listen to games all the time, and, and it, was, it, was, it was really revealing to me that that second generation that I'm talking about that would have become the great Whaler fans and would have had the income to be able to support the team uh, buying season tickets— right. It was it was pulled away from him at, at the wrong time from their perspective. Longtime Hartford sportscaster Rich Coppola. They built uh, a ballpark called Dunkin' Donuts Park, basically uh, uh, a stone's throw from where the XL Center, the old Civic Center, is located. And they they uh, chose Whalers colors, which is a smart move. <laughs> it's a great ballpark. They just won uh, another poll for favorite Double A ballpark in the country. I think it's the second year and fourth time they've won it and they do a whalers weekend and uh, andre lacroix has been back almost every year uh, a bunch of players come back and it's it's really a lot of uh, a lot of fun 20 miles west of hartford sat espn the self-proclaimed worldwide leader in sports broadcasting and chock full of hockey fans forsland traces it back espn in its early stages needed programming and aside from some of the fringe sports they were doing and the college sports that they were doing, which, as you know, growing up in the Northeast, college sports are not important, right? They needed they needed programming. So the NHL was in their backyard, so they would get a truck into the Hartford Civic Center and they do NHL games. And so they had an emotional attachment. But in Connecticut, you have UConn, and then there's UConn, and then there's UConn, and, and then there's the Whalers, and for a lot of the young people that grew up in that generation, they loved both of those entities, and a lot of them went to work at ESPN behind the scenes. So you had a large portion of their um, employees that loved the Whalers. And they also loved, you know, the perk of coming to our building and getting in the press box. So they were really upset 
And I think they, because of that, they were like, they also saw what it did to the fans. They were like, all right, we're not going to give these guys a chance. So it was, uh, there was some real bias there, which didn't help us at all in North Carolina. There's no doubt that was the perception here in North Carolina. But at the time, Glenn Wesley appreciated that kind of attention. Chris Berman uh, used to come down to the locker room. Uh, Steve Levy was was down there every once in a while. You know, those those guys were were always around, and and uh, you know they were they were great supporters. And you know, it's great to see that ESPN has hockey back, and and they're they're certainly passionate and uh, big hockey fans. So it's, it's it's great to have them. You know, get the contract and being able to uh, do broadcasts again. Then Whalers media relations director, Chris Brown. ESPN loved having us, you know, down the road or up the road, whichever way you want to call it. We would have guys, their anchors, um, get off and then drive up and catch the third period. You know, they'd come through the press gate Mm -hmm. and catch the third period to, to see the games. Chris Berman was a huge Hartford Whalers fan. Um, he would bring his kids when they were little, um, you know, on weekend practices, stuff like that. It was, you know, they, they were big supporters. And I, and I think from their perspective, they did what they could. I think they really wanted the team to stay in Hartford as well. And I think they probably lobbied alongside Mr. Carmanis to, you know, to make a new arena deal and make Hartford a big deal. Unfortunately, Governor Rowland and, and, and that um, administration, they just didn't see fit. They didn't, they didn't see it in their, their future. John Buchagross arrived at ESPN as the Whalers were starting what turned out to be their final season in Connecticut. And maybe because it was all new to him, he didn't sense or maybe realize any animus. But he did know this. There are a ton of old Whalers fans still on staff. You know, Jim Zaroli, who produces our games, uh, at ESPN now, uh, one of our producers, who now that we got hockey back, still wears his Whaler hat all the time. Uh, and here in 2022, 2023 season, there are certainly pockets of people, ESPN being a young company at that time, only 17 years old when I got hired. A lot of New Yorkers, Connecticut people, a lot of local people. And so, yeah, there were certainly a number of Whaler fans, and I'm sure there were little pockets of uh, of people who were mourning and upset and can't believe they're losing this NHL team. I mean, obviously, it's a special thing. There's, there's only so many of them. You know, at the time, what, less than 30. So, you know, when you had one, you want to hold on to it. And Hartford was obviously, I still think it's the biggest market without a pro sports team in America right now. The home finale got emotional for a lot of people, according to Jeff O'Neill. And I always think about a guy like Kevin Deneen who came back to Hartford and played in that last game. I was injured the last six or seven games. So, you know, just that last game, seeing the fans and Kevin addressed the crowd, you know, after the game. And it was a pretty sad moment. So... That's how it ended, and we we ended up going to Raleigh. There are always forks in the road in life. What would have happened if? Well, let's hear from Rich Coppola. 86 team, uh, a lot of people think, including uh, the Canadians who beat them in seven games, that if if the Whalers had won game seven, then they may have been Stanley Cup champions. I felt when the Ron Francis trade was made, that – may have in some ways been the beginning of the end. Maybe so, but economics always rule the day. In 30 seconds, a sneak peek at a supersized challenge in year one in North Carolina. Episode three breaks new ground as NHL hockey comes to North Carolina. Glenn Wesley and his wife had to do a little research. Barb and I actually, we, uh, we, we got an atlas out, and a lot of people don't, don't know what an atlas is, the young kids today, but we pulled it out and uh, we looked at it. They were hog exports. So we went like, okay, so we're, we're going to have to uh, teach the game now, you know, from, from a grassroots stage and being able to share that with a lot of uh, young kids. We were able to grow up as a uh, longtime Caniacs now. The Carolina Hurricanes will not only have to perform on the ice, but they feel they have to be somewhat of ambassadors for hockey in an area that's smothered in basketball. But really, they can't wait to get here. 
this morning when Mr. Kermanis spoke to the players and told them it was going to be rally uh, area, the Carolina Hurricanes. They were pretty excited about that. I mean, uh, all hockey players love the golf, and uh, I think we've got a lot of basketball fans, so this is a pretty excited bunch of guys. Now that we all know where the team was headed, who was coming along for the ride? John Forsland. Then there was a meeting with all the players, the coaching staff, and front office people who were coming south in their conference room in Hartford with Peter Carmanis on the squawk box and a conference call type thing and a speaker phone. And the one thing that he said, and, and it, it still resonates with me, is I will never put any of you or your families in a bad situation. But then we make the move. And then in that summer, I had one year left on my deal. The Boston Bruins announcer retired. He recommended me for his, his job. I was one of three finalists for the position with Sean McDonough and a guy named Dave Shea. Dave Shea got the job. Sean and I did not. Sean continued to work for the Red Sox. I decided to come to Raleigh because I came and had dinner with Jimmy, and he asked me on loyalty. He said, I gave you your shot. I know you got a year left. Can you just give this a shot? The Hurricanes' home opener didn't go according to plan on the ice, but in the stands, Carolina couldn't have hoped for more. Close to 19,000 fans invade the Greensboro Coliseum to see this new sport called hockey. Oh, it was great. It was a good atmosphere to play, and the fans are pretty loud, and they're into the game. And, uh, you know, it's always more motivating as a player when, uh, you know, the crowd's into it and they're, uh, you know, they're yelling and screaming. Big crowd for the opener, but Jim Rutherford and the team were up against it. There was no build-up, no promotion, no nothing for an NHL team coming. And you have to create that kind of excitement. I mean, you see it. You see what they did in Vegas. Mm -hmm. You see what they did in Seattle. They knew that that team was coming two, three years prior to that. And uh, and there's a big build-up to it. And, and, you know, you're gaining momentum. Here we are. We come out of nowhere, and all of a sudden we're here. And we're not even really here in our permanent home we're playing 70 miles away in greensboro this canes 25th anniversary podcast series is part of the capital broadcasting podcast network thanks to our friends at the aluminum company of north carolina with special assistance from rusty helser i am adam gold see you next time you've been listening to the canes corner podcast with adam gold The Canes Corner Podcast is a part of the Capital Broadcasting Podcast Network.